Uh, just uh, again, welcome, Rachel. Yeah, I hear you. Please go okay. ahead, and uh, we would love to hear from you and share your 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 information, your insights, and inspiration. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you to Rabbi Schmerling for his kind introduction. Ten years ago, I spoke in this synagogue, and it is truly an honor <clears throat> to have a to receive a return engagement. <clears throat> My first notion of death came from the movie, 1970s movie, Love Story. How many of you remember that movie? Yeah, right, okay. <clears throat> it starred Ally McGraw and Ryan O'Neill. They were a young pair of college students. <clears throat> from disparate backgrounds. She came from a poor background and he came from a super rich one. He was a real preppy. Despite parental opposition on both sides, incidentally, they fell in love and they got married. Shortly thereafter, Ellie McGraw, who plays the, uh, the wife um, and the heroine, she fell ill with cancer. And she went from gliding on the ice in Rockefeller Center in all her splendor and beauty to her deathbed at Mount Sinai Hospital. The hospital scene portrays her as follows. She had a perfect flippy hairdo. She had a suntan. She had a frilly nightgown that looked like it came from Victoria's Secrets, but there was no intravenous tube and no jaundice and no edema and no physical distress. This was clearly not based so a distortion that it robbed me from the ability to respond with dignity to life's final passage. Now, <clears throat> some of the things I'm going to say in the next little bit, you might have heard from uh, Rabbi Schmerling in, in previous sessions. But I just wanted to review, how do Jews perceive death? The Jewish tradition has remarkable things to say about human dignity. Few people, however, are aware of the fact that this dignity is expressed even after death. Jewish law and custom, as we know, uh, provides guidance for every life cycle. Uh, birth, bar and bat mitzvah, marriage and death. <clears throat> Rachel, your, your mic is not working. Uh, you're muted, hold on. You have to unmute yourself. On the left bottom corner, there's a microphone. Click on it. On the left bottom corner. Okay. No, here. that was good. Oh, can you perfect. hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. I forgot. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so I was saying that people have, have no notion of what happens. As a result of not knowing, only about 15% of Jewish deaths are accompanied by Tahara, the ritual. It is especially important at the end of life when emotions may cloud your judgment to know that Judaism imbues this milestone with spiritual significance that protects the dignity of the deceased. The overriding principle of preparing the dead for burial is kovid hamet, respect for the dead. Let me give you a few examples. There is a shomer, a, a, like an honor guard from the time uh, present with the deceased from the time of death to the time of burial. And that person uh, generally recites to heal him. The human body 
they must be treated with respect because it is the receptacle of the soul. It retains sanctity much as the ark retains its holiness after the Torah is taken out. Almost everybody is reluctant to talk to confront death. <laughs> when I, I first began to write the book, when I came to Boca, and I remember one woman said to me, let's face it, it's never going to be a bestseller. Well, you know, that's the feeling of not being able to confront death. My mother always spoke in very hushed tones about somebody's death, as if it were contagious or something. Rabbi Irving Greenberg, who wrote the four Rachel, you're, you're muted again. Maybe uh, you're hitting a button or something when you talk. Try to unmute one more time. Okay, I'll keep it closer to me and I won't do that okay. again. Okay, uh, to confront death without being overwhelmed, driven to evasion or dulling the senses is to be given life again as a daily gift. What are some of the origins of the Hever Kaddish? Most people don't know that they date back to Moses, the death of Moses on Zion Adar. And it is believed that God performed the Tahara on Moses because there was no organized Hever Kaddish. Another source is from Mishnah Shabbat, written in the third century which makes reference to the washing and anointing of the deceased. The Talmud in Moet Katan states that when someone in the community dies, there is to be no work or commerce until the deceased is buried. Now, it's very interesting when you read about the early immigration to the United States, uh, people who wanted to have a synagogue before they developed or raised money for a building, they bought a plot for a cemetery so that people would be buried with dignity and respect. Today's model for the Hever Kedisha is based on the one organized in Prague in 1564 by Eliezer Ashkenazi. I've always used, viewed death as the ultimate chaos in life. I believe, however, that the rituals serve as a roadmap to guide you through this difficult terrain. Yeah. Tahara is the ritual preparation of the deceased for burial. The word means purification. It is performed by the Hever Kadisha, the burial society, which is made up of community volunteers that prepare the dead for it during this ritual. The Hever Kadisha provides care for the body and comfort for the soul. The ritual is analogous to an opera in which the libretto and music blend and enhance each other. In a tahara, there is a fine tuned harmony between the tasks and the and the prayers. For example, as we dress the deceased in white shrouds, we recite this passage from Isaiah. Can you hear that noise in the background? No? Okay, then I'll keep going. We recite this passage from Isaiah. We, we do hear somebody in the background. We do. Okay, let me just take a break. <laughs> okay. I'll close my door. I fortunately don't live alone. <laughs> George, would you please be quiet? Okay, then I am back. Okay, so I was talking about the harmony between the tasks and the prayer. So as we're dressing a person in shrouds, the following prayer is recited. My soul shall be joyful in my God, 
for he, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom puts on priestly glory and as a bride adorns herself in jewels. The actual tahara is <clears throat> in three parts, cleansing, purification, and dressing in shrouds. Throughout the ritual, <clears throat> Throughout, the ritual is accompanied by lyrical prayers from prophets, psalms, and song of songs, thereby bearing witness to death as the last uh, of life's important passages. Um, I will please excuse me, I have an allergy, okay. For example, as advocates for the deceased, we introduce her by name to the Almighty in the opening prayer. Master of universe, have compassion for Rebecca, daughter of Nahum, this deceased, for she is the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants. Through mercy, hide and disregard the transgressions of this departed. May she tread, tread with righteous feet into the garden of Eden. For that is the place of the upright, and God protects the pious. Similarly, we the final prayer of forgiveness, after we have done all the ritual, the team gathers around uh, the casket, and they ask Michila, they ask forgiveness for errors of omission and commission. We then assemble one last time outside the funeral parlor to wash our hands to indicate a distinct separation from the dead. It has been the custom of the Westchester Hever Kadisha to watch each, wash each other's hands as opposed to just washing our own. This demonstrates our ability to care for the living as well as the dead. So what are some of the basic principles of Tahara? <clears throat> there is such an intricate attention to detail. For example, the deceased is never placed face down. We don't pass anything over the deceased. Instead, we walk around. Like for example, if we have to pass uh, a scissors or some tape or any object, we never pass it over the deceased, instead of which we walk around as a sign of respect. Blood which flows after death represents the soul and is buried with the deceased. Such as if there are blood spots on the sheet that's covering the deceased, we cut out the spots and place them in the casket for burial because it represents the soul. We speak very little, and if we do, it is only about the tasks at hand. It is believed that the soul hovers uh, from the time of death until the time of burial. Who does this? Whenever I tell somebody I'm a member of the Fever Kadisha, and you know, just broadly in broad strokes, I tell them what I do, the response is, I could never do that. Well, the truth is nobody knows whether they can do it or not, because none of us have done it before we tried. I think maybe there's a self-selected process that goes on behind the scenes, and nobody volunteers who doesn't sustain their commitment. Actually, in the many years that I did Tahara's, I can only think I can only think of people who had like uh, an illness or illness in the family that they stopped doing it for a while, but they usually came back. Women serve women and men serve men. They <clears throat> undergo two hours of training, a uh, training, not in all chevers, but they should undergo training before they start and generally work under the leadership of a captain. And depending on the 
condition teams work uh, teams consist uh, Rachel, you're breaking up of course we don't know when people die and we don't know what time so it's always a surprise Rachel, we can't hear you. It seems like the connection is slow by you. Um, I think we lost her again. Well, it's definitely a challenge, but it's definitely a I hope she comes back. Meanwhile, if anybody has any uh, questions, as she was mill saying was that it's uh, that people who commit are pretty very much committed to come and do the tahara. Um, and uh, she was saying, there's never a time you know when a tahara can happen because um, you know we don't schedule taharas. Um, I think she's coming back on. Rachel, you were back on. I see your name. I don't see your video. You got to click video and audio. You know, the getting a, a preparing for the Tahara, she said, um, man do for man, woman do for woman. Um, and the And, um, and if we have here on our group, a few of, of the volunteers who joined our local Chava Kedusha here. And I wanna, I wanna uh, um, acknowledge Malka Forshner from Fort Meyer Chava Kedusha who has joined and trained and is our captain for the women's Chava Kedusha and her husband Shmuel for the men's Chava Kedusha, um, as well as Clay, uh, who's here, Clay Shafton and others who want, if, if you'd like to consider joining or come for a training um, it is, um, we, we can definitely, um, we would like, we'd like to have you on board. Um, she is still trying to get on. Let's wait. I'll give over some more information as she's trying to get back on, or I can try to connect her through the phone. Maybe if she's having a hard time with the computer. Hmm. Phone is a good idea. Yeah. Hold on. I know you can call in on Zoom. And that might work better. Let me call her and give her the number. Right to call in. Let's give us another minute. Okay, here you're back on. I see you're back on. Yes, I see you. You have to unmute yourself. You have to, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Where are we at? You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Hi, folks. 
I'm sorry. Um, all right. So I was saying that my husband would tell the recruits, I can't give you the time and the place because I don't know when people are going to die. And he said, you will always have something else to do. You will never have anything better to do. There is an egalitarian aspect uh, about what we do, uh, what we do for the deceased and in the book about the behavior of the people who do it. The ritual is the same for everybody, regardless of your degree. As long as you're a Jew, you're entitled to a tahara. There is no judgment in a tahara. A tahara team can be made up of a construction worker, a corporate attorney, a rabbi, a nurse, a house person, a housewife. Uh, everyone participates on an equal level. They pour buckets, they carry buckets, they sweep the floor of the Tahara room. There is a tremendous bonding among me team members. I have been a member of, I have been a member of a Hever Kedisha for 17 years before I began to write my book. What did I find, what's that? What did I find surprising? Something very significant happens when ordinary people do this extraordinary thing. The personal impact is profound. Natalie, who worked with the Englewood, New Jersey Hebra said, I feel I have been blessed with the ability to do this mitzvah. Some people have beautiful voices, others play musical instruments. I feel that being able to perform a tahara is a gift from God. A woman who read my book shortly after her mother died posted the following on Amazon.com. It was comforting to know that her final journey was met with the caring, sensitive, and meaningful ritual of Tahara. The dignity and spirituality of the process was in keeping with how she lived her life. Clever Kadisha groups exist everywhere. There was, there was one in Greenfield, Massachusetts, which I think has maybe 2,000 Jews. And uh, uh, all the people who had been to the Hever either died or moved away. And there was only one woman left. And she had to do it with the non-Jewish uh, uh, daughters of the, um, of the uh, funeral director. Now, Burlington, Vermont, in the 60s, uh, had adjacent to them the communes, where there were lots of young Jewish people. So they put out a message to these young Jewish people, would they come and help with the Hebra? And, and they came, and they were so taken with the, superior, the, the, the spirituality and the commitment that many of them became members of the synagogue. Um, the impact on Judaism is, as I have mentioned, is, is magnificent. I interviewed um, a member of the Portland, Maine, Hever Kadisha, who in the middle of the winter was looking for a team of three or four people to do Tahara. On, and when he came to the bottom of the list, a 14-year-old answered the phone for his father, who had been a member of the Hever Kedisha, and the 14-year-old said, my father is away. Can I do it instead of him? Now, he had already been bar mitzvah. Well, with reluctance, they let him do it. And what happened was that uh, the, the head of the Hever Kedisha watched him very carefully to see what his responses were. Well, he did everything he was told and seemed to be fine after the Tahara was over, but still he thought a little discussion might be in order. So he asked him, you know, how do you feel about this? He says, well, I'll tell you. Last year I had a bar mitzvah. Uh, I leaned pretty good. I had a big party. I got great gifts, but I didn't feel any different as a Jew. Now that I have done a Tahara, 
I see what Judaism is all about. Now, this is a 14-year-old. I'm not suggesting that all 14-year-olds become members of a chevra, but I'm telling you that it impacts everybody, no matter what age, with, with uh, an enormous amount of awe. The other people who are very much impacted are balei tshuva, people who, Jews who are returning to Judaism. Now, very often those people, when they return to Judaism, they can't be called to the Torah because they can't read Hebrew. It's hard for them to go to a shir because there's so much they don't know. But especially if they have been very athletic in their lives, they're very good in a tahara because they have the manual dexterity to do this. And for them, it makes them feel more Jewish or very Jewish because in a tahara, they can do it better than anybody else. And finally, uh, uh, I did interview a convert to Judaism. And she said that she never felt uh, really accepted by people. And, you know, she was trained to do the Tahara and did it with a number of people who are born Jews. And she said, I felt so accepted. It was an extraordinary experience. Now, normally a Tahara takes 45 minutes. Uh, that's if you don't have special challenges. One of the special challenges is doing the Tahara on children. And uh, I have, <clears throat> in my lifetime, I guess, done two. Uh, one was a seven-year-old um, uh, car accident victim, and the other was a baby who died of cancer, a little girl. And you know, you have to get the right team. You can't get young people uh, who have their own young children. You... Well, again, I will say nobody knows if you can do this until you do it. And it was enormously challenging, but they're Taharas I will never forget. Um, how are we doing for time, Rabbi Schmerling? Do I have time to? Read yes. a story about a Zaha volunteer. Yes, I yeah, do. Go have? Ahead. Yes, go oh. ahead. All right. Now, um, let's see, where is it? Here. Now, Zaka is an organization in Israel who are the first line responders when there's a terrorist attack. And the way you can identify them is that they have uh, bright orange vests and they're there the minute they are notified. Now, um, the person I interviewed was an Israeli, but did a lot of business in the United States. And he uh, uh, was driving uh, along the street in Jerusalem <clears throat> and he noticed a bus just ahead of him. A terrorist appeared from behind the bus and began shooting people in the bus. Even though I was not trained, I got out of my car and began taking out the injured. One of the injured I took out was a 12-year-old girl who died in my arms. A Zaka volunteer came up behind me and told me, as I had told you before, that every drop of blood that comes out of the body had to be retrieved and buried with her. My clothes were full of blood. There was blood on the pavement everywhere. The girl was taken to the identification center and then to the funeral home for burial. I had to go home and change my clothes and surrender the blood-stained garments to the funeral home so that the child could be buried with them. Since I got involved, I felt obligated to be present when the family was notified. <clears throat> so I could tell them exactly what happened. I accompanied two other Zaka volunteers. When we got there, we knocked on the door, but there was no answer. <clears throat> we decided to try the door anyway. When we did, we saw that there were lots of people gathering and they started singing happy birthday in Hebrew, of course. 
in honor of the girl's 12th birthday. They thought she was on her way home and this was supposed to be a surprise. Usually, Zaka comes with a few people, <clears throat> one of whom is a psychologist to deal with probable trauma. Some families come in, become enraged and start throwing things and hitting so that at least two or three people are needed to handle whatever comes up. In this instance, we chose to call out one family member to inform her. The person was a cousin of the victim. She began to scream and then the whole family came out to see what happened. You can't imagine the chaos, the screaming, the shock. For about an hour, place the same day, I was supposed to leave for Israel that night but changed my flight so that I could attend the funeral. This incident totally changed my life. I feel there is nothing more important in the world than my helping Zaka in whatever way they ask I do so. Okay. Um, in 2006, um, I received a phone call while I was still not finished writing the book. As a matter of fact, I think I was working on it when I got the phone call. And it was from PBS, uh, the broadcasting company, the television company. And they had a program called Religion and Ethics Newsweekly. And they wanted to do a segment on Tahara. They had heard about it from somebody. And they had read an article I wrote for Hadassah magazine. And um, they wanted to know, could they come and do it? Come and you know, observe a, 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 the Tahara and film it at the same time. And I said, no, because it wouldn't be respectful to the dead. But would they consider doing it on a mannequin? That if they're uh, filming a mannequin having a Tahara done. And they agreed. Um, fortunately, I knew somebody in Westchester who, who manufactured mannequins, and he was also a member of his fiber. So he was happy to send us one, a mannequin, a woman. And the Hevra and the two people I had done Taharas with for decades uh, joined me. Uh, doing the Tahara. I guess, and we're going to see that segment in a few minutes, uh, the most incredible response came from the cameraman who had just, not Jewish, who had just returned from Iraq. And you can imagine what he was uh, filming there. He said, never in his life was he so moved as, and, and he hugged us all and was just overwhelmed by the experience. Okay, can we watch the movie, the segment, Rabbi Shmerling? Yes. No matter whatever is going on in my life before I walk into the Tahara room, no matter how troubled and obsessed I might be about something, it totally, totally disappears during the time of the Tahara. It is the most profound connection with my Judaism, both task-oriented and spiritual at the same time, and, and so intensive that it's almost a lesson for how to do other commandments. I think it's considered the greatest mitzvah because um, the person that you're serving, the deceased, can't say thank you. The purpose of the Tahara is to provide um, comfort for the soul and care for the body. We talk very little except about the tasks at, at hand. When we're working on the deceased, we never pass anything over the body. We always walk around as a sign of respect uh, for the dead. 
I have a distinct sense that the soul is hovering and is in transition as we do this. And that makes us that much more careful with the body. May it be your will, Lord our God and God of our fathers, to bring a circle of angels of mercy before the deceased, for she is your servant daughter. It's definitely changed me. Uh, for one thing, it's um, put my own mortality in much sharper focus. I don't think I have a fear of death. Um, and I can kind of imagine what that would be like. I have thought about my own Tahara. And I also find it so enormously uplifting and rewarding that when I, if I would get a call to do it, I mean, why wouldn't I do it? It makes me feel um, so good about myself and gives a lift to the, to the rest of the day. I always like to look at a Tahara. It's almost analogous to a three-act play. There are three distinct parts. There's cleansing, there's purification, and there's dressing. In the cleansing phase of the Tahara, we remove all the bandages and anything extraneous on the body. And I will pour upon you pure water. The purification is a cascade of 24 quarts of water that are poured by the entire team uh, in a continuous flow. And it's an analogous to a mikvah, which is the purification um, that women go through following their menstrual cycle. And it's as if we're, we're washing away all the suffering of their last periods of, of, of their lives. And it's as if it's like a veil that you leave behind. Tahara he, Tahara he, Tahara he. She is pure, she is pure, she is pure. And then the body is dried, and uh, the final stage is dressing in the shrouds. The shrouds are, are fashioned after the garments that the high priest wore in the temple on Yom Kippur. And uh, they're white, usually made of linen, uh, hand sewn with no knots so that uh, they will disintegrate easily. Uh, they also have no hems, also to signify the impermanence, and no pockets so that you take no worldly goods with you. And everybody, rich or poor, young or old, uh, religious or non-religious, are all parried in the same garments. And then the body finally is placed in the casket and wrapped in a large sheet, which is, creates almost a cocoon-like um, okay. image. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a sense of protectiveness as the person uh, enters the world to come. We sprinkle um, earth from Israel at the bottom of the casket before we place the, the body in there. And then uh, after the deceased is completely shrouded, we place it on the eyes and on the heart. Um, and that's our connection with our homeland. At the end of the Tahara, before um, we put, we close the lid, the team gathers uh, around the casket to ask forgiveness of the soul for any errors of omission or commission and assure the soul that we have done everything within our power to do this correctly in accordance with our customs. Dina Bas Jacob, we ask forgiveness from you if we did not treat you respectfully, but we did as is our custom. May you be a messenger for all of Israel. Go in peace, rest in peace, and arise in your turn at the end of days. We address the deceased by name, and that makes it very specific and very personalized. Um, and I usually wish her well. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, can we hear you? Um, all right, uh, just a few words about the response to the book. Uh, I was uh, privileged to get two very prestigious awards and excellent reviews. And a presentation I gave at Barnes and Noble attracted non-affiliated Jews with terminal illnesses. For them, 
Their fear and anxiety about death was turned into understanding and comfort. In 2006, um, I was invited to do a workshop at an annual Chabad Shluchus conference in New York. Now that's uh, an event that attracts all the female, all the women who are serving as shlichot all over the world. And there must have been about 1,500 at that meeting. And, and um, I got, I, 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 there weren't 1,500 people at my workshop, but there were about 30. And I got the following response from uh, a Lubavitch woman who works in Brazil. And she said, I have lent your book to many people. Everyone who has read it has told me that it was an amazing eye opener. Not everyone who reads the book is ready to join the Chaver Kedisha, but they are left with a feeling of awe about the mitzvah. You are enlightening the new generation of the importance of helping the Jew into the next world. Congratulations and Hatzlacha Raba. And I have a final note about the outgrowth uh, of the book. Um, that wouldn't have happened had I not written a book on the topic. But writing a book suddenly positions you as a big expert. And um, the most gratifying out outcome of the book has been the development of a course that teaches Jewish day school students enrolled in high school about Tahara. Now in its seventh year, hundreds of young Jewish people throughout the English speaking world have been transformed spiritually. Let me share with you one of my students' comments. Um, Tani, a handsome 18 year old high school senior at the Cassie Yeshiva High School, of South Florida, faced a course on Jewish death rituals with both apprehension and curiosity. Said at the completion of the final journey, how Judaism dignifies the passage, he said, I really knew nothing. I assumed when a person dies, he's dressed in his best suit, placed in a casket, and then buried. And that's it. The final journey course really made me appreciate the dignity and respect that Jewish customs offer the deceased. Learning about this brought light to a full circle. At this point, we're just high school students. But when the time comes for us to encounter death, in our own families or the families of our friends, it's good to know that such beautiful customs, traditions, and rituals accompany the end of life. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Rachel. That was so moving and touching. Um, if there's any questions, uh, you can uh, either, uh, yeah, Diana, you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Um, it's, um, yeah, I, I have, first I want to say that I was extremely moved and impressed with your talk. And um, my own return to Judaism came from learning about this when my mother passed. I knew nothing. I was raised not knowing anything. So thank you. The, the question I have in the video, in the PBS video, did I hear correctly that you put soil um, from Israel on the eyes? Where the eyes? Yes. Well, there are already um, shards on the eyes. So we just put it on top of that. And when, when shards. well, Part of the preparation is if the eyes are open, we close them okay. before the Tahara. Yeah, what, what, what's your concern? I, I, just, I, it, it, I just wanted to make sure I was hearing you correctly, that the soil goes on the eyes. 
On the yes, on the closed oh, eyes. Yes. Over the eye. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the eyes are the uh, you know the window to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. It is powerful. Thank you for. I'm glad that these sorts of things come through, even in a video that sometimes works and so. Yeah, it was very doesn't. effective. I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else with questions? Yes, uh, Liz. Yeah, Elizabeth. Mine is, is not so much a question, it's just, yes, hi, I'm in Israel right now, and I made Aliyah from Michigan, oh. and I am part of, I'm, I'm part of Hever Hadisha in Michigan. And um, one of the things that um, is, you know, there are things that are common to all the Taharas, um, and some things that are different. You mentioned about on the shrouds, no hands, and and the shrouds that we used actually had sleeves. And um, so, you know, so the customs do vary. Oh yes. I'm sorry, I yes. couldn't hear you. The things that are the, the things that are the same is everybody gets cleaned, everybody gets purified with the water or a mikvah, and everybody gets dressed in shrouds. And then the customs vary. Right. I mean, it right, it refers to the local area and the custom of, of that area. Let me tell you, it's very hard to go from one chaver doing it one way and find another chaver that does it another way. And But uh, I think the menhag is you do it the way your new chaver does it, out of respect that that's how they do it. Yeah. And, and and I have to agree with you. It's a very very um, emotional experience, um, and very um, it's it's a very necessary group of people, and you really can't thank them enough. And what was interesting, which you didn't mention, is that in a small community, um, one of the rules was you, the family members were not to know who did the tahara. You know, there was to be no discussion at the funeral or the shiva about anything that happened, that it's all kept in the privacy of the, out of respect to, to the dead and to the family. Yeah, you know that um, that's probably the custom of most, or it's least one that what it, was adhered to long ago. In the Chaver, both in Westchester and here, there was a certificate that was given to the family that had the names of the Tahara members that did it. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting, yeah. Well, let me tell you about an experience. So, you know, I generally didn't talk about it much. You know, if I talked about Tahara, I talked not about a specific one or certainly not about mentioning anybody's names. But on the way home from one Tahara that I did on the mother of one of my neighbors, I saw him and I knew he, he didn't know anything about this. And I decided to tell him that I was one of the people that did his mother's Tahara. It was such a sense of comfort to him to know that because he knew I wrote the book and you know I knew what I was doing and so on. In any case, I invited him for breakfast the next morning just to talk. And he came and actually my son from Israel was there too and my husband who's done lots of time. And I gave him a copy of my book. He, it was a very important thing for him to know. So I guess I have mixed feelings about it. Go ahead, go ahead, Elizabeth. One more thing. The first Tahara that I did was for my next door neighbor. And she was oh. only 53 years old. And she was a Jew by choice. Uh -huh. And, you know, she felt that if it wasn't her faith, she would not be able to make it through this difficult time. 
Um, but what was interesting for me was, was in doing the Tahara and with the women, I felt like we were a bunch of mothers putting her to bed. And she had never had a Jewish mother put her to bed. And I was able to take a lot of comfort in knowing that my dear friend who I lived next to for many years, you know, became a Jew, loved the faith, and there were the Jewish mothers that gave her her final resin. That's beautiful, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing that. I will, in a future talk, share your story as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. That was, that was very powerful, we just shared. Um, Dr. Lyons. Yes, uh, I have a question. You mentioned specifically a linen shroud. Uh, when I made arrangements, or my wife and I made arrangements, we chose, because we had a choice, we chose a cotton shroud. Is there anything nasty about that? Um, Is it accepted? Yes, I don't think there's a difference. Um, I, I think Rachel's He's frozen. She froze. Yes, I don't believe there's a difference um, about the material. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, but the, broke, but the, but the, yeah, and I can hear you. But you Pardon did me? the research. Go ahead. Again. Again. Did you hear the question? Is it again? He said they chose the cotton ones, right? Yes. Yeah. Is it against? No. No. It's just minhag. Right. It's not. It's not a, a law. Right. There's very little that's really halachic. I think about uh, tahara. You know, that's why we had to dig. Well, away. well, the there whole the, the whole concept of of all the rituals of death um, are minhag, which are custom dating back all the way back to Moses, as you said. Um, but we may, when we have a minhag, especially such an ancient minhag, it turns to be halakha. It turns to be halakha. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but I've heard that in a long time. Thank you. <laughs> so no, it's not like what is the minhag? What type of hamantashen we eat on Purim? <laughs> is it the mon or the raspberry? And that's that's not a that's not an important minhag. But the minhagim during tahara are are very important minhagim. Uh, and I want to share, is there any other questions still? Yes, I have a go question. Ahead. Go ahead, Sandy. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what, Mira, go ahead, Mira. yes. What did you say happened to the soul before body is buried? I said, um, it is said, you know, that the whole, the soul, while you're doing the Tahara, the soul hovers. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that room, so we don't talk or anything. We just concentrate on what we're doing. So it's around. Pardon yeah. me. Yes, it's, it's around. around. Yes. But in this room, no, nowhere else. Nowhere else. No. So it's able to see what's going on. That's right. That's right. Okay. It's amazing what I just heard, Rabbi. Thank you so much for organizing this. For me, it's eye-opening. Yep. Yes. And uh, thank you, Mira. And Sandy, you had a question. Yes, I, I noticed that the shroud, obviously the shroud is the last thing that you put on the body and that the head is covered so you uh -huh. can't see someone's face. And uh, you made sure right. with quite a few um, twirls there. Uh, so that the shroud doesn't come off. So I'm going to assume that afterwards, whether it's a man or a woman, they are buried in the shroud and they are not buried in any clothing. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. Right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, uh, as uh, Rachel mentioned, and that's really the, the beauty and the purity that we all come... <laughs> We all, we all come naked to the world and we all live equal. Um, we don't bring any of our materialism with us to Hashem. That's why um, there's no pockets or I don't know, Liz, about um, the pockets that you had, but that's okay, but we don't one put anything person, in. One huh? person can't hear. 
Um, also, we do we do bury mail um, if they if they want. We give them the option to bury in the in a talus or in their talus. But we are very sensitive to the deceased. And give you an example. Even if we wrap after we wrap them in, after they're in shrouds, we wrap the talus around. For the soul, it's very painful to be in a talus because it wants to make a blessing. It wants to fulfill the mitzvah and it no longer has the ability to do so because you can only fulfill the mitzvah in a body. So just to give you a visual, what do we, what do, we do when we wrap a person in a talus? We actually take a scissor and we cut one of the corners of the talus, making the talus non-kosher so the soul shouldn't feel I have a kosher talus and I can't do the blessing. I'll just show you here is a corner of a talus that we uh, cut last time we did a tahara. Um, but that's the uh, that's that's how sensitive we are to the body and the soul. Um, that's how far it goes. Any other questions? Yeah, Diana. In, in um, our beliefs, does the soul ever retur return to this space? Not. I, I like very much what you said that. The soul is just in that room. Yes, and very never, much so. So, 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 again. so the soul always remains alive. The soul goes. The soul goes through a transition. And I know, and I'm, I'm, I, I plan. I'm planning to give a class because we did not discuss so much what happens to the soul after burial. We went all the way to burial, and we did not discuss about the afterlife so much. What happens in the afterlife with the soul? And God willing, we will schedule one or two classes just on this topic, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, and I will, I, I probably gonna have to wait till after Pesach to, because I wanna give it over properly with uh, all the resources um, and share that with everyone. But absolutely, the soul continues to live on. And the transition between death and burial, the soul hovers over the body. The soul also is in the Shiva house, doing the Shiva. Um, one of the reasons we cover the, the, the mirror so the soul doesn't see its reflection or that type of, that's, or, or pictures and stuff like that. So there's very much on that topic um, that, we, that, we, that we discuss. Any other questions? Yes, Sandy. Can you be buried in Venice Gardens without a tahara? In our, in our section, no. Okay, thank it's you. Our, it's, our, it's in our bylaws. Okay. Uh, but we will, but we will, Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, we will accommodate anybody uh, with Tahara. That's, uh, you know, we, it's a, it's, it's a, um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I want to just wrap up. Is this a, the, t tonight is Purim. Um, today is the fast of Esther. We, we actually fasting, but tonight we are celebrating Purim. And the, the difference between Purim and Hanukkah, which are the two holidays that are not in the Torah, the holidays that the, 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 the sages enacted after the two miracles that happened, the main difference, the, the Hanukkah we celebrate with light, the menorah, which, is, which, which was a spiritual war. The war was not on the bodies of the Jews. It was about the soul, Yiddishkeit. They wanted to defile the temple. Haman, on the other hand, wasn't didn't couldn't care less if Jews are 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 spiritual. He wanted to kill the Jews. It was a war on the bodies. That's why the celebration of Purim is with the body. We eat shlachmanus. We we celebrate with a meal. On Hanukkah, we don't have an obligation to have a meal. So the Purim brings together the body, the celebration of the body, and the soul, and the survival of the Jewish people. And when I say together, because it, it, the reason that we're celebrating Purim this year, and we're celebrating for the last 3,000, two and a half thousand years, and we will celebrate forever, is because the reason we are around, our physical, be, our physical existence, is because our spiritual connection that we have with Hashem, our neshama to Hashem has given us. And as long as we nurture that, we can ensure that we have a survival. So we are celebrating not just a story that happened back then, but a story that keeps happening every single moment as our existence. 
and Tahara is uh, brings that that pick that that that, uh, that together. Tahara is, in a sense, a celebration of body and soul, the harmony that comes together. And as we'll discuss in the other cl the next classes, how in our, our belief of not just of the afterlife, but actually that we believe that the soul returns into a body with the coming of Mashiach, which we call Tchiyat HaMetim, the resurrection of the death. Why is that a fundamental principle in Judaism? Why is it so important? We will, we will discuss, stay tuned on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel, again. I will post the, uh, you have the link, and I'll, I'll post it in the email that we'll send out to all those who sign up for the class. And uh, I want to bench you, Rachel, to have many more years of health and gesund and nachas from all your holy work and keep inspiring many Jews around the world. Thank Amen. you for oh, joining the happy program. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Rabbi, you, Rachel. Send us the link where we can buy a book. Yeah, I'll, I, will, uh, I will send the link on the email. You can find it on Amazon. The, the name is Dignity Beyond Death, but I will send it in the email as well, God willing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.